Hey, greetings, everyone. This is Koku. Uh, a few minutes late. I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> I apologize for that. Um, this setup sometimes is tricky. Uh, we are reading a paper. The full name of this paper tonight is actually Intellectual Warfare Theory and Practice. Gates, Thornton, White World Terror Domination, and the War on Afro centricity and this is an obadali or obadale camblin paper um this came up because as a, many of you are aware malefe dr malefe asante um <clears throat> and uh, afrocentricity international parted ways recently if you tune into shoot the breeze uh, we talked about this only to say from the pro-black perspective broke it down a little bit as to um, you know what really happened, and the gist of it is that Molefe has gone away from Afrocentricity in its original form, and now he's talking about it's more so about humans, and it's not about race and all this kind of stuff, humanity. So um, I remember that. There was some critiques of Malefe and them by Obadale in the past, and so I wanted to read this paper. I see we got Tito District in the in the chat. Peace to Tito District. Peace to that sister. She says peace, Coco, in the chat. I appreciate you for being here, and I appreciate all of you for tuning in. What we're gonna do? We're gonna start the show now, and on the other side, we'll begin reading this uh, somewhat lengthy paper. All right? We're gonna start the show now, and on the other side. We will begin the reading. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Just want to remind you guys before we get the show rolling that this show is part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. The other shows on the network you are invited to tune into. This is D Web with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the Revolutionary Matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am indeed your host, Koku. Let's get into this paper. Right, intellectual warfare theory and practice, Gates, Thornton, white world terror domination, and the war on Afrocentricity. And you, as you see right there, it's by Obadale Camblin, who I've had on the show before, too. Need to reach back out to his people to try to get him back on the show again. So, um the abstract says this article provides an analysis of attempts to conceal white culpability in the enslavement of African people in service of white world terror domination as perpetuated by Henry Lewis, quote unquote, Skip Gates Jr. and John Thornton. 
Thus, the white terrorist, anti-African, anti-black integrationist imperative is examining Gates's Wonders of the African World, 1999, and Thornton's Africa and Africans in the Making of the Atlantic World, 1400 to 1800, and in earlier historical appropriations and subversions implemented by white terrorists of various types, with or without the assistance of their anti-African, anti-black collaborators. Make sure you guys hit the like button for me. Do me that favor. Make sure you hit the like button. Uh, the keywords for this paper is Afrocentricity, Intellectual Warfare, White Supremacy, War, and Hotel. So th this brings us to the introduction. Following a massive 2014 hack of Sony Pictures emails, Henry Lewis Skip Gates Jr., currently the Alphonse Fletcher University professor and director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University, became embroiled in a scandal when it was discovered that he helped Ben Affleck, a white man, cover up his forefather's involvement in the enslavement of African people. While such a revelation may have come as a surprise for those not familiar with the history of the questionable integrity of Gates, for those who have followed his unquestionably anti-African, anti-Black scholarship, at least since the premiere of Wonders of the African World in 1999, it was par for the course. Prior to the revelation of this particular instance of concealment of white culpability in the enslavement of African people, Gates penned an article in a similar vein in the New York Times, in which he illogically and inarticulately place the blame for the enslavement of African people on people in Africa while absolving the white perpetrators who masterminded the whole process and were its primary beneficiaries. The rampant miseducation of Gates permeates his works. However, he has not gone unchallenged. In short, it appears that the leopard cannot change his spots after all. Back in 2009, Gates was arrested in his own home in an incident in which this quote-unquote post-race scholar cried racism. While some may have hoped that this incident would have been a wake-up call for Gates, judging from his continued anti-African, anti-Black trajectory since that time, apparently, the incident was easily forgotten as Gates pressed the snooze button and went right back into an anti-African, anti-Black post-racial slumber. Indeed, rather than reforming and changing his ways, Gates has doubled down on his agenda of promoting a Frankenstein-style anti-African, anti-Black, and a historical construction of quote-unquote Afrocentricity. In his promotion of his, this agenda, Gates appropriates the term Afrocentricity as a tool in his ahistorical anti-African, anti-Black toolbox. Interestingly, Gates has not worked alone in this unholy crusade. He has a partner in crime, namely a white man by the name of John K. Thornton, currently a, press, a professor in the history department at Boston University, who specializes in the history of Africa, the African diaspora, and the Atlantic world, who, in his text, A Cultural History of the Atlantic World, 1250 to 1820, perpetuates just such an agenda to absolve whites from responsibility for the enslavement of African people while placing the blame squarely on the shoulders of African people in the name of central intelligence agency. Um, however, as I have argued elsewhere, this too is not a new phenomenon for Thornton. For example, Thornton's Africa and Africans in the Making of the Atlantic World, 1400 to 1800, uh, which came out in 1998, and Gates's Wonders of the African World, which came out in 1999, served as a one-two punch, a combined slap in the face of African that is black people. Thus a double-pronged attack of intellectual warfare with the ultimate aim of protecting whites by throwing black people under the proverbial bus. Brings us to a section called Interrogation of Blame Shifting and Historical Precedent, juxtaposing Afrocentricity. In this work, I interrogate the questionable agenda and scholarship of this tag team duo and their works using a framework in which their appropriation of the term Afrocentric for their demonstrably anti-African, anti-Black machinations can be understood in its appropriate historical context as part of an ongoing war against African people waged by whites, represented by Thornton, and their anti-African, anti-Black collaborators, 
represented by Gates. I see KW Dawn 7 is here. KW Dawn 7 said, uh, Sawabona, listening from the gig, we'll check the replay. All right, appreciate that. Appreciate that. Make sure you guys hit the like button for me. Make sure you hit the like button. It helps me a whole bunch. All right. Um, to continue, further in this article, I would like to trace the precedence for Gates and Thornton's anti-African, Af anti-Black Afrocentricity to two key works that foreshadowed the recent Sony Pictures revelation, Gates's Wonders of the African World and Thornton's Africa and Africans in the Making of the Atlantic World. In each of these works, Gates and Thornton respectively attempt to shift the blame for the enslavement of African people from the pale or white Eurasians, primarily of Europe and Arab origin, who organized it and thus were and still are its primary beneficiaries, not the African equals black people who were its primary targets, locked in interminable wars, forced labor and terrorism. This blaming of the victim is then deemed Afrocentric due to its putting Africa at the center of responsibility for the actions originated by and primarily beneficial to Eurasians. In this exercise, I will show that there is a precedent for oppressors adopting and harnessing instruments originally created by and for oppressed people as articulated by Thornton himself. I will then draw an extended parallel between this historical precedent and the current anti-African, anti-Black agenda continually and consistently being pursued by Gates and Thornton in the name of an of an agency bestowing ethnically cleansed Afrocentricity. And interestingly, the term Afrocentricity has been used in a proxy war as a straw man to simply knock down in the interest of essentializing a whole host of traditions of African thought that are to varying degrees non-integrationist that seem to pose a threat to the white terrorist, anti-African, anti-Black tradition in this program of intensive subjectivity laced with ulterior motives. The agenda is not only to vilify any and all who may be broadly associated with what may be termed a diabolic Afrocentricity, but it is also marked by a usurping and appropriation of the term for the sake of its currency and familiarity to ultimately serve white terrorists, anti-African ends. Hence, in relationship to the improper use of Afrocentricity, I implicate that I refer to as white world terror domination. White world terror domination should be understood within the same context as the phenomenon commonly referred to as white supremacy. But implicit in my phrasing is the notion that whites are not actually supreme, but instead work to dominate others by the use of terrorism. How many of you... Uh, are feeling the use of the phrase white world terror domination greater than um, white supremacy, right? How many of you feel that is more impactful than the um, misnomer white supremacy? To continue, this exercise works to document the white terrorist, anti-African, anti-Black integrationist imperative. Hence, the imperatives that those who practice white world terror domination, white terrorists, and their collaborators, anti-Africans, anti-Blacks, have in common. Foremost among these imperatives, for example, is protection of white terrorists from justice, retribution, etc. The general thrust is that if white terrorists are not to blame then there can be nothing done to them or against them as evinced in wonders of the African world. That's Gates and Thornton's Africa and Africans in the making of the Atlantic world, conveniently posited as two sides of the same anti-African coin. Right? The degree to which Christian clergy sought to... Did I miss... Oh, no. The degree to which Christian clergy sought to explain the revelations of another religion by seeing them as diabolic or divine determined the degree to which they would tolerate aspects of that religion. If a religion were discovered to be founded on diabolical revelations, then the church had no choice but to adopt it. 
to, uh, sorry, had no choice but to adopt what I have called an exclusive approach to it. All its wisdom must be denied, a cost that was clearly reflected in the destruction of Mexican codices. But if some of the revelations of a religion were discovered to be of divine origin, then much of, the, much of its content would be accepted in an inclusive approach if it could be cleansed of the diabolical elements. This is um, Thornton, by the way, the white boy. The above quote will serve as a framework for understanding the orientation of both Henry Louis Gates Jr. and John Thornton in relation to Afrocentricity. This orientation is manifested in Gates's Wonders of the African World and Thornton's Africa and Africans in the Making of the Atlantic World. As case studies, as I have argued elsewhere, the historical roles played by Gates and Thornton with respect to real Afrocentricity are analogous to that of the Christian clergy, described in the quote above with respect to the quote-unquote diabolical revelations of indigenous religions. Thus, similar to strategies adopted by the Christian clergy in its religious, cultural, and ideological warfare against indigenous religions, only non-threatening elements of Afrocentricity, such as the, met the methodological imperative of simply making Africa central, are adopted. Even this imperative is only in, uh, adhered to when consistent with the quote-unquote discontinuous revelation of what may be referred to as the religion. For example, a specific fundamental set of beliefs and practices generally agreed upon by a number of people of white supremacy. The orientation of Gates and Thornton, uh, this guy actually references is Tariq Nasheed, it seems, in, from 2016, that's why. This orientation of Gates and Thornton towards real Afrocentricity constitutes what may be termed intellectual warfare, according to Carruthers, 1999. This brings us to a section of the paper called Afrocentricity Diaboli Diabolized in a Scapegoat Proxy War. I see we have some folks in the chat. Let me read some comments here. In the chat, we got Trigger Happy 262 Plus. I haven't seen Trigger Happy in a minute. Trigger Happy says, I usually just use white hegemony. It basically encapsulates who is in control and leaves it at that. White world terror domination is a mouthful. I kind of agree. It is a mouthful. Um, Tito District says his term is definitely more accurate and impactful than white supremacy. I, I, I agree with both of those statements you all made. Um, it, 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 it's more impactful. It definitely outlines the situation pretty well. But like um, Trippy, but like like uh, Trigger Happy said um it's a mouthful right trigger happy 262 plus says white hegemony ties into the idea that their control implies they systematize the ideology of quote unquote white supremacy and their control can be deduced to be terrorism because imperialism colonialism is terror absolutely absolutely thank you all for those comments keep them coming i'll read all your comments live uh on the air so Afrocentricity diabolized in a scapegoat proxy war. According to Molefe Kete Asante, professor and chair department, um, chair of the Department of Africology and African American Studies at Temple University, who is largely responsible for popularizing the term Afrocentricity. Afrocentricity is a perspective. And for him, Afrocentricity is the belief in the centrality of Africans in postmodern history. Hence, Afrocentricity is vibrant in that it is not static, uh, typological, or structural. It is dynamic, uh, processual, and flexible, the only rigidity being the centrality of Africa as symbol and spirit. Thus, for Asante, Afrocentricity, therefore, is only superficially related to color. It is more accurately a philosophical outlook determined by history. This aspect of Afrocentricity defines it largely as a methodological and functional perspective, a point that was quickly seized upon by white terrorists, like anti, you know, white terrorists, anti-Africans, anti-Blacks. I will put, sorry, I will demonstrate this activity below. So this is, this is important. And this ties back into 
you know, why I, I, I chose the paper in light of, you know, uh, Afrocentricity International breaking ties with Malefe Asante. Basically, um, <laughs> this is going to sound bad to say, and I, I don't mean this in a bad way per se, but basically, the way Malefe Asante put forward Afrocentricity, right? Um, it, it, it centers Africa, but it doesn't center blackness as well, right? And when you do that, you let all the charlatans, all the grifters, all the naysayers, all the bullshit artists, all the white terror, or to, uh, white terrorists, you let those guys into the fold. And so the part of what I'm trying to kind of show here is like, because it wasn't constructed, like some would say, because he didn't stand on stuff strong, in a sense, um, you could kind of see where he would now become, especially now that he's an, 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 an elder and older, you decide. But you could kind of see where now he will change up his view. And some people are saying he changed up his views for the bag, by the way. Well, we talked about this on Shoot the Breeze. So you guys should tune in to Shoot the Breeze. I'm going to add the chapters uh, sometime by Thursday so you could actually just go to the individual prompts and you could go to this particular prompt and conversation. So this is the important part of this here. This is why I talked about Malefe in the beginning. And this is why I chose this paper in, in, in light of that separation. So I hope you guys understand that now. I see um, Marcus McGee is here. Peace to Marcus McGee. He says, I like it because when you use the words white supremacy, people feel like you're giving power to them, but you're only saying it to explain the system that is in place. I agree with that. Gas them up is here, saying peace, family. Peace to gas them up. Gas them up has been a great addition to the panel on um, Shoot the Breeze. So if you guys have not gone back and listened to the playback of Shoot the Breeze episodes, or if you haven't been present in the chat these last few weeks, I suggest you come through and shout out to Jay, who's been on the panel. He wasn't there Saturday past. But he was there the two previous Saturdays, and he, he, we had some um, dialogue in the comment section under the last shoot debris video. You guys can go and check it out. Um, shout out to Jay as well. I hope he's back in the near future. Trippy says his position on North Africa kind of made me question him when he had a panel with Obadale Campbell. Okay, tell us. Um, that that's interesting. T t tell us what was his position. What was his position on North Africa? Because I, I have some feelings of, about that North. We, you know, we have that. We have a North Africa problem too, and a lot of folks, probably rightfully so, are saying we just need to focus on West and East for now, and then we'll deal with the you know the rest of that later. Oh, Jay is here actually. Jay say yeah. Sorry about that. No, it's it's no problem, Jay. No problem. Sometimes it's like that, you know. Um, Jay says, I'm here. Power to you, family. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so Jay is here. Two great additions to what we had on the panel, and I hope to see them again, both of them, in the near future. All right, let me continue. But yeah, Trippy, let us know what his position was on North Africa. As further delineated by Asante, Afrocentricity is pro African and consistent in its belief that technology belongs to the world. Afrocentricity is African genius and African values created, reconstructed, and derived from our history and experiences in our best interests. In the book Afrocentricity, Asante asserts, when tactics become the objective, we fall victims to self-deception. Many of our thinkers have warned us of the danger of this view. There can't be but one true objective, objective for us in the contemporary era to reconstruct our lives on an Afrocentric base. 
Ironically, Afrocentricity, as the name itself implies, can be principally defined in terms of its tactics, the methodological imperative of simply placing Africa at the center. This is a tactic that is only scarcely modified by the vague and easily discarded caveats of pro-African and, quote-unquote, in our best interests. Gates and Thornton each summarily dispense with these caveats, while at the same time adopting the only rigidity, that is, the methodology of simply putting Africa at the center. This is analogous to what Thornton refers to as the inclusive approach. Thus, cleanse of diabolical elements designed to serve the quote-unquote best interests of his African or Black creators are now, cast uh, are now castrated and Afrocentric stunt double is systemically employed in the service of the new religious imperative of white world terror domination. The concept and practice of white world terror domination by means of deceit in this context may be defined as a historically based, institutionally perpetuated system of, ex of exploitation and oppression of continents, nations, and African black people by white people and nations in Eurasia that are buffered, supported by carefully selected African equals black people who are the system's secondary beneficiaries for the purpose of establishing, maintaining, expanding, refining, and, def and defending a system of wealth, power, and privilege, AKA the interlocking static dynamic system of white world terror domination. That's according to Neely Fuller. One who practices white world terror domination is thus a white terrorist dominator. It should be noted that white world terror domination, that is a mouthful, should not, however, be equated with a simple class argument. Indeed, white terrorist tendencies cut across all class lines, according to the late Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. If it's a class problem, wherever the black white dynamic exists, then the white is the upper class and the black is the lower class. And your lower class is much lower than white folks' lower class. And your upper class ain't nowhere near the top of the white upper class. If you are a communist, the white communist is on top. The black communist is on the bottom. If you are a socialist, the white socialist is on the top. The black socialist is on the bottom. If you are a Christian, the white Christian is on the top. The black Christian is on the bottom. If you are a Jew or Hebrew, the white Jew on top. The black Jew is on the bottom. If you are a Muslim, the white Muslim is on top. The black Muslim is on the bottom. Whatever the social, political, economic, academic, religious, spiritual system or order is, you're on the bottom. Where, where, wherever the black-white dynamic exists, you'll find the white on top and the black on the bottom. So that reminds me, me and Jay um, was talking about, you know, uh, um, that, that Islam thing. And so you guys um, go check out the last episode of Shoot the Breeze. Check out the comment section. Add your opinions to that brief conversation that we had. And I, and I, I want to find a way to have a longer conversation about this in the future, about this dynamic, uh, the, 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 the dynamics of, you know, these religions that I look at as foreign gods and foreign religions, but there's a dynamic that usually plays out and right here, uh, the brother Khalid Abdul Muhammad says, if you're a Muslim, the white Muslim is on top, you know? So he even acknowledged that, you know? Um, but I digress. Um, despite this dynamic, or rather because of it, the black person on the bottom of the black-white dynamic, albeit a victim of white world terror domination, may defend and maintain white terrorist systems of perpetuated wealth, power, and privilege in the interest of, of, of obtaining a few crumbs, remnants, leftovers, and hand-me-downs that powerful white terrorists see fit to drop from the table of the feast pilfered from the African farm. Uh, I said this before. I, I, I particularly like how Obadale and uh, his father write. Um... But that that half of a paragraph there, that's powerful. And I wish some of our brothers and sisters in the U.S. will take those words to heart. 
in the perpetuation of white world terror domination, white terrorists engage in what may be referred to as intellectual warfare, a systematic discrediting, disrupting, misdirecting, and or neutralization of rival ideologies that may pose a threat to the existing order of the establishment, for example, Afrocentricity, Black nationalism, African-centeredness, Pan-Africanism, etc. As such, the war on Afrocentricity serves as a proxy war in which Afrocentricity serves as a straw man scapegoat that once rejected serves as a blanket rejection of many other oftentimes more threateningly pro-African or pro-Black expressions of thought, word, and action. In the foreword of Afrocentricity, written by uh, Karamu Welsh, in making the case for Afrocentricity, she acts rhetorically. Quote, the question most often encountered is why? Why the need for an Afrocentric philosophy? Why should Africa be at the center? And my question is, why not? Apparently, this question was also quickly seized upon and incorporated by the new clergy of white world terror domination. Why not put Africa at the center? Especially when doing so perpetuates the religion of white world terror domination by transferring culpability for the genocide of millions of people of African heritage from the shoulders of whites to those of African people. Mm. This system or religion of white world terror domination should not be mistaken for racism. Racism is at the periphery of the white terrorist worldview and is but one of many capes utilized by the matador system of white world terror domination and the individuals who perpetuate it in essentially the same way that religion, the hard sciences, the social sciences, and more recently Afrocentricity have been used. And in an extended analogy, right, that's likely Bobby E. right, articulates that in a bullfight, after being brutalized while making innumerable charges at the movement of a cape, there comes a time when the bull finally turns and faces his adversary with the only movement being his heaving bloody sides. It is believed that for the first time, he really sees the matador. This final confrontation is known as, quote unquote, the moment of truth. For the bull, this moment comes too late. The experience of black people all over the world presents an analogous situation. For hundreds of years, they have been charging at the banners that are held by European white matadors. Therefore, it is indeed black's moment of truth, and it is time for them to look at the matador. Mm. You know, we um, I usually have this, uh, this um, listener who goes by Bobby e. Wright in the chat. I think he would have appreciated that just now. I think he would have appreciated that just now. Um, in the chat, Trigger Happy says he will lose, he, he was loose on it, saying we should not give it up. When people say that, they never equally clarify that the people on the land actively ostracize us. So I took it as him wanting to include them. Goes on to say, Obadale takes the position that we need to leave them alone and focus on building with black people exclusively. Yeah, that's kind of the thinking. Most people who are uh, pan-African or African nationalists or stuff just said, forget about them. And just build in, you know, in quote unquote black Africa. Uh, Gas Them Up says, Europe is a creation of the mind. We need to attack that mindset. I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, according to Gates, hold on, Afrocentricity is indeed a dynamic and flexible tactic that can be adapted to serve the interests of anyone who's willing to literally or figuratively put Africa at the center of his or her discourse. This is the loophole and the flaw by which the concept from its very first extended articulation has been plagued. According to Gates' own assessment, surely all scholars of Africa and his, uh, and his diaspora are by definition Afrocentric. 
if the term signals the recognition that Africa is centrally in the world as much as the world is in Africa. But this is a source of the problem. All Afrocentrists, alas, do not look alike. That's according to Gates. After appropriating the term, Gates is then successful in effectively othering the diabolically inspired Afrocentrist in his statement, quote, I am certainly not in the same camp as Malefe Asante and all those guys. All right? Thus we find the term, or more so a few of its ideological premises, appropriated and thoroughly co-opted, while the original theorists and practitioners are vilified and demonized. This is the work of the clergy of white world terror domination in relation to the potentially threatening diabolic revelation of Afrocentricity, threatening in the sense that it goes against the white supremacist, overt and covert goals of self-preservation. But what evidence is there for any attempt by Gates or Thornton to vilify or demonize Afrocentricity as part of their intellectual warfare? Their own words are enough to show that they are aware of and are actively participating in intellectual warfare against the version of Afrocentricity that does not serve their white terrorist interests. In Thornton's case, examine the following excerpt. Many community activists are well-meaning people, like those in Gates's barbershop, and their own knowledge is shaped by the struggle of the 60s and nationalism. But they can see where the pressure needs to be applied, and it is in the schools above all. That is why it is they who have created a lot of quality materials from an education standpoint to use in schools. But a lot of these materials are harmed by nature of their information, which often comes from the more extreme end of the Afrocentric movement. The activists, Afrocentrics, are not li likely to win more than limited victories in their battles. Their agenda is not popular in most of America, and their accuracy is suspect in many circles. Thus, even when they present ideas that most of mainstream scholars would accept, they are rejected as being wrong in content or divisive in tone. Those of us who would prefer to see a more, quote-unquote, mainstream agenda need to present it ourselves. Perhaps we should be thinking about how to do this and give Gates his due for producing this year's wake-up call for African history. And that's why this white boy. That's a, that's, a, that's a serious that's a serious thought he put out there to his academic community. The activist Afrocentrics are not likely to win more than limited victories in these battles. Their agenda is not popular in most of America. And their, and their accuracy is suspect in many circles. Now, here's the crazy part, right? In the public fool system of education, Their accuracy is suspect in many circles. And that's something that black folks do to themselves too, by the way. Black folks self-harm themselves in that if you put out a piece of information and you got a detail wrong or something, or you misstated something, Black folks will shit all over whatever it was you was trying to present to begin with. We do that to ourselves. Meanwhile, meanwhile, you guys will learn that uh, however many million Jews died during the Holocaust and don't know that they quietly, you know, they quietly um, lowered the number by several million. Right, like I, like most people, I think learn like something like four thousand or six thousand Jews died, and they quietly uh, amended that number. No one talks about it; it doesn't even come up. Right? What about that accuracy? Right? 
But you go and you 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 tell black folks something about uh, I'm just throwing out a name here, Frederick Douglass or something, or Garvey or something, and you misstate a fact, they'll 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 shit on that whole thought forevermore. You know, we got uh, Mr. Untouchable in the room, saying respect to all brothers and sisters, respect, Mr. Untouchable, what's going on? Um, Gaston Up says America will never allow Afrocentricity. And I agree. Uh, earlier, Gaston Up says European, Europe is a creation of the mind. We need to attack the, that mindset. He says the occult games at play that Muzungus have is under have us under is scary. Some of the strongest voodoo is with the whites. He also says the Pope has his meetings in a room that resembles a snake. Is that right? Uh, okay, I didn't know that. That's that's cool. You see, this is why I like shoot the breeze and why I like to do the live streams when you guys come through. Even though the numbers might be small, we, we, we talk, we communicate, we share information and thoughts and whatnot. And I appreciate that, man. Um, to continue, if we simply examine the language of Thornton, his use of terminology is consistent with that of intellectual warfare. He argues that, quote, the activist Afrocentrics are not likely to win more than limited victories in these battles, end of quote. Further, strategically unnamed Afrocentric scholarship is discredited in regards to accuracy, content, and tone. There is, again, however, an inclusive approach adopted for the divinely inspired quality materials if they can be cleansed of their diabolical elements of extreme Afrocentricity or substituted for the divine discontinuous revelation of the mainstream white terrorist agenda. Such is the nature of the intellectual warfare of white terrorists against the vilified and discredited other diabolic Afrocentricity. Gates makes a similar statement of war against Afrocentric demagogues and pseudo-scholars. Quote, in the raging battle of who will speak for Black America, in the raging battle for who will speak for Black America, I, I, I don't like how this is formatted. Uh, this labeling as demagogues and pseudo-scholars is part and parcel of the warfare against the diabolical revelations and prophets of Afrocentricity. This labeling is the classic white terrorists and their anti-African, anti-Black collaborators, modus operandi, in which the pseudo and demagogue of today are analogous to the diabolical origin and witchcraft of yesterday. This is yet again consistent with our extended metaphor linking modern white world terror domination with the Christian church of yesterday, wherein all forms of popular, revel popular revelations were attributed to the devil. All such revelations could then be labeled as witchcraft and their, and their practitioners burned, as indeed thousands were. According to the late Carruthers, founder and former director of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, founding member and director of the Comedic Institute in Chicago, and a professor of inner city studies at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago, in his warfare campaign on behalf of white world terror domination, Gates aggressively submits to the Republic's mandate that US born Africans must be a part of American society and a part acceptable to European American authority. Ah, oh, that's a, let me, let me read that again. Make sure I get that right. I like that actually. If you're enjoying the paper so far, drop a one for me. Let me know that you're here. Let me know that you're listening and that you're getting something from the reading. Drop a simple one if that's the case. So Gates aggressively submits to the Republic's mandate that U.S.-born Africans must be a part of American society and a part acceptable to European American authority. So that's, that's from Carruthers. Such an assessment, if correct, is consistent with our working definition of white terrorism. Although Gates is merely a collaborator, an agent working on behalf of white world terror domination. Thornton further outlines specific war strategies of this intellectual warfare. 
quote, as scholars, we or someone we can work with need to get the scholarship out to the public, specifically through the school system. Scholars in this context may be read as white terrorists, but with whom can they work? Fountain's own analysis of the past is useful in understanding today. Quote, the church still accepted most of the revelations that came under its control or that were not threatening, such as apparitions of saints and the virgin. Enter Henry Louis Gates and his pseudo Afrocentric wonders of the African world and John Thornton's own contribution to the battle with his agency bestowing Africa and Africans in the making of the Atlantic world. And indeed the church of white world terror domination accepts both of these apparitions as part and parcel of revelations that come under its control. I see we have a bunch of ones here. Uh, I appreciate all of those ones from you guys for letting me know that you're enjoying what you're, you're hearing in this reading. Wonders of the African world represents a weapon of mass destruction in the full scale intellectual warfare of white world terror domination against quote unquote diabolic Afrocentrism. You know, a uh, quick question. Are you guys. Um, are you guys familiar with this work, Wonders of the African World? Are you guys familiar with um, Africa and Africans in the making of the Atlantic world? Uh, you guys who are here live with me in the chat, you let me know if you are. You know, let me know if you're familiar with that work. Gas them up says no, not really. Okay. Um, but yeah, so uh, Wonders of the African World represents a weapon of mass destruction in the full scale intellectual warfare of white world terror domination against diabolic Afrocentrism. Our question now becomes how has this war on the diabolic version of Afrocentricity influenced, nay, infused the work of Gates and Thorn particularly? This question becomes pertinent as the diabolic Afrocentricity is viewed as a threat to the church of white world terror domination vis-a-vis -vis the church's approved version in a manner similar to what necessitated old switcheroo used in Mexico as described by Fountain. This was exactly the attitude of the Spanish clergy in confronting Mexican religion. For example, when they heard Aztec stories of uh, I did this word, man. Quinn Sacodal, a good king deified by the 16th century, who had been driven from Mexico by trickery and would return in glory. They decided that Quinn Sacodal uh, must have been the apostle Thomas, bringing word of Christianity. And those who drove him out must have been inspired by the devil. Thus, they sought to persuade the Aztecs that they were restoring Quinn Sacodal by bringing Christianity, while at the same time vigorously attacking most current Aztec practices as being diabolically inspired by Quinzacodal's enemies. That's diabolical. And again, this is why I question our adherence to these religions, these Abrahamic religions in particular. I digress. Similarly, Wonders of the African World by Gates and sponsored by PBS and the BBC is a part of a continued war of white world terror domination on the diabolic version of Afrocentricity using a whitewashed version of so-called Afrocentricity as a weapon. In this new version, Africa is indeed placed at the center as required by Asante's aforementioned articulation of the perspective. To understand the reasoning behind placing Africa and African people at the center in this particular context, it is insightful to note Kwame Ture's statement that you can make no analysis in the life of an oppressed people and leave out the oppressor. Anytime you make an analysis in any aspect of life of an oppressed people and leave out the oppressor, you will blame the oppressed people for their conditions. 
Man, that's a, yeah, well stated. This is the crux of the white terrorist friendly Afrocentricity. This is the crux of the white terrorist friendly Afrocentricity. Africa is at the center only when putting Africa at the center absolves the oppressor. For example, Eurasians and Americans from guilt for the abject conditions of African people that they created. You know, uh, if you guys have people who you think should be hearing this stuff, uh, share it. You know, I know some of you guys gas them up, etc. Have these e these email signs. You know, share it with your folks. Let people hear it, man. You know, let let people hear because. And uh, by the way, if you want this paper and you're on the Discord, just hit me up and say, "Hey, let me get a copy of that paper." Right, because this is the stuff, and the reason why I like to read these papers is because it brings together information from various sources, like a bunch of information from various sources, and puts it usually succinctly together. Wherein us as the readers, the listeners, we can go back and and, and kind of pull this information from the original sources, just based on what we, you know experienced in the in 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 these readings right um but that kwame ture statement is is dead on uh to continue but why would gates fight against other african people on the behalf of white world terror domination once again thornton's analysis of the past is useful in understanding the present slaves augmented the military might of the iberians whenever there was a danger from native americans for example, on early Hispaniola, royal instructions demanded that Spanish settlers arm their most trusted slaves, normally those with, normally those with a family, called secure blacks, or negros seguros, in case of a revolt by the Tainos, and later still to protect various colonies against foreign incursions. The role that Gates now plays is analogous to that of the secure blacks, of the Iberian armies in the fight to defend the Republic of Western letters from the foreign incursions of quote unquote bad Afrocentrists. Gwendolyn McKell, professor of anthropology and foreign service, Georgetown University, correctly identifies this tendency in Gates' wonders of the African world. According to McKell, Gates has crafted his own attack on Afrocentric views of the greatness of Africa. It seems to me that Gates's video attempts to paint a picture of an imaginary divide between African Americans and African views of the continent and its role in history. Gates pretended that the West was not hegemonic in its relationships with Africa during the pre-colonial and colonial periods that traversed the slave trade. He pretended that the only pressures creating transatlantic slavery came from African greed, from forces within the continent. You know, <laughs> you know there there was a there was a reggae song back in the day called "By His Deeds," and um, you know, oftentimes I think about by his words, right? When you hear certain black people talk, <clears throat> you can directly run it back to like one of three or four people. You could run it back to. Now, it, it depends on what side they fall on. You could run it back to Thomas Sowell. So if you listen to Candace Owens, you know where she gets that shit from. You listen to Larry Elder, you know where he gets that from. You listen to um, this little effeminate fellow. What's his guy's name again? I forget the, the guy who says, who told Ambrose, uh, men, are, men are slut makers. Um, Jesse Lee Peterson. Um, you know, you could tell, and right now you can tell who's a Tariq listener. You can tell uh a Vet Carnell tone tone talks listener. You could tell a, a professor black truth listener. Like you could tell by it's the shit people regurgitate. Mr. Untouchable knows what I'm talking about. He says by his deeds shall a man be known, right? You know, so I always find that interesting, you know, and you could tell 
there's people who listen to Skip Gates, Skip the Truth Gates. You know, um, is, is Mikhail's assertion plausible? Gates's own writing validates her statement. He asserts that the diabolically inspired version of Afrocentrism produces shoddy scholarship, wherein Afrocentrists rediscover a lost cultural identity or invent one that never existed based upon the shaky grounds of self-esteem. Wonders of the African world, therefore, plausibly represents Gates' attempt to disavow this quote-unquote invented cultural identity. Despite the implications of the title of his video, Wonders of the African World, you guys check and see if that's on YouTube. Maybe it is. Uh, Martin Kilson aptly notes Gates's long-standing tradition, his schizophrenic tendency towards aggrandizement, machoism, in relation to African people in terms of Gates's almost neurotic need to couch discourse on African-American sociocultural and political patterns in what I call black put-down terms, a mode of intellectual discourse on black realities that Gates's intellectual confrere, Kwame Anthony Appiah, is also addicted to. I should add, second, much of Henry Gates's discourse on African-American sociocultural and political patterns exhibits a thoroughly chameleon trait and almost manic need to produce a discourse on black realities that that migrates between a black put down or black averse mode on the one hand and on the other hand a seemingly redeeming black friendly mode though in ultimate essence the redeeming posture is phony as ali mazruri uh, who, who lived from 1933 to 2014, rightly put it, Gates seemed incapable of glorifying Africa without demonizing it in the second breath. You, you have to be a special brand of person to be on that shit, right? Uh, Gates's own declaration of war against the quote-unquote shoddy scholarship of bad Afrocentrists invented racial fantasies and identity supports the idea that wonders of the African world is part of his own attack on mythical Afrocentric views about the greatness of Africa. Thus, the presentation is a state of the art weapon in the intellectual warfare of the white terrorist Republic of Western letters against such diabolically inspired Afrocentrism. Why, however, does Gates leave the European out in his analysis of the enslavement of African people? On this issue, Asante argues that if one listens closely to Henry Louis Gates, the entire project of slavery would not have occurred if it had not been for African involvement. Blaming the victim for the predicament of, of enslavement is neither historically correct nor morally valid. How was this project sold to the white producers? Were they told that the video would show how Africans were responsible for our own predicament? The themes covered in the series rest on some disturbing subtexts, such as the undermining of Pan-African sentiment, the reinforcement of negative stereotypes, the separation of ancient e Egypt from the rest of Africa, the attack on the Swahili language, and the undermining of the movement for African reparations. If the analogy of the secure black fighting a, dia a diabolized Afrocentricity on the behalf of white world terror domination is correct, and it is, then it is very likely that this is how the project was sold to white producers. Masrui questions, why is Skip Gates presenting us with a simplistic picture of continental Africans, villains, selling their brothers and sisters, diaspora African victims, and provoking what he regards as the curse on Africa for selling his children? In reality, only a small minority of the inhabitants of Africa could have sold and exported fellow Africans. So why is Africa as a whole presented in such stark, evil ways? Why does Henry Louis Gates Jr. virtually let the white man off the hook on the Atlantic slave trade apart from a throwaway sentence? What is going on? What is the agenda? So I see um, Tito District lets me know that Yes, this this video that um, they're talking about is on YouTube. So you guys check it out. I'm going to check it out as well. I'm going to check it out as well. And what I might do 
I might I might repost it on to the community tab for this uh YouTube channel. And I might drop some questions or something. Uh, and hopefully you guys will come back, you know, you'll see it and you guys will will join me in the discourse uh after I've dropped a few questions. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. Gaston Up says Henry Louis Gates is a white man. He is selected by the establishment because they need his image to serve a purpose. Mr. Untouchable says, when I hear this, I think of Du Bois and Garvey or John Henry Clark and Dr. Cornell West. Yes, it's yes, it conjures up all those all those images. This agenda can be understood as an integral aspect of intellectual warfare in the service, not of racism but of white world terror domination. As a matter of fact, the guise of fighting racism in all its Pernicus forms, especially diabolized Afrocentricity, has been one of the means by which Gates has secured a position among the clergy of white world terror domination, perhaps as an overly eager and willing altar boy. This is affirmed by Martin Kilson's statement that Henry Gates is above all trying to play back his way to a special public self portraiture, one he considers politically serviceable. First of all, there should be no doubt among progressive African-American intellectuals that Henry Gates, as the leading African-American academic entrepreneur, intellectual in the country, these days has an intellectual persona and modus operandi vis-a-vis -vis black world realities that is riddled through with establishmentarian and sometimes anti-black purposes. Kilson's establishmentarian and anti-black are synonymous with my claims of his support for the religion of white world terror domination against his enemies, the so-called diabolic Afrocentrists. In addition to absolving whites of their role in the, in, in the enslavement of African people, and then attacking the diabolically inspired revelation of Afrocentricity. Gates indeed does paint a serviceable and appropriately syncophantic self-portrait for white terrorist approval. This self-portrait is useful in obtaining the white terrorist vote of confidence as the most likely candidate, quote, in the raging battle of who will speak for black America, end of quote. George, George Nelson Preston, um, George Nelson Preston, a.k.a. Nana Kwaku Anakwa, uh, also takes note of Gates' political machinations for his own personal benefit, which is not very dissimilar to the picture that he paints of the rulers of old Asante and Dahomey. Tracing, his, tracing this development uh, chronolo chronologically, Preston declares, Gates did praiseworthy work in literature, became highly visible, and whites now use this high-profile visibility as a criteria to make him expert in everything Black. It is an open admissions ticket of a sort as the most knowledgeable uh, Black about every and anything Black. It would appear that Gates has been crowned as the new Negro in residence, designated to represent us in all matters, Black by Black, be they literature, sociology, anthropology, art, history, archaeology, art criticism, history, etc. Apparently, the selection of Gates as the Negro in residence is convincing, as conveyed by Bayadun Jeifo, who totally buys the idea of the figure of Gates as an American, as an as an African American everyman confronting Africans. Masrui much more uh, adeptly recognize that we must not drift into the fallacy of regarding Skip Gates' point of view as the African-American perspective. As for Pan-Africanists and Afrocentrists, Missouri is quite correct in asserting, quote, almost none of them regard Gates, <laughs> uh, Gates's voice as their voice, sorry, end of quote. Indeed, Gates fits the profile of one of the secure Blacks that have been handpicked to fight for the per the perpetuation of the system of white world terror domination against the diabolically threatening revelations of Afrocentricity and its generally 
identified by the black community at large as a modern day king buzzard of sorts. Uh, this is a, this is a a, a, a long um, paper. Again, I hope you guys are enjoying it. Thank all of you who are here live with me right now as we do this reading. Ms. Untouchable asks a question in the chat. He said, question, who gave him the title of the leading African-American academic, entrepreneur, intellectual? I'm curious. He goes on to say, Ms. Untouchable says, maybe because he teaches at Harvard. Um, yeah, that those titles, you know, There's a saying, and it, it kind of irks me when I hear black folks use it. But there's a saying that says, you know, the streets didn't, the streets don't mess with him. The streets didn't pick him. People have said that about Dave Chappelle, as a matter of fact. Like the streets didn't really pick him, right? Uh, white folks chose him, you know. So that, I, I, I would say that's the same of um, Skip the Truth Gates. Here. It is highly dubious that Gates's black friendly posturing of tough love, agonizing about the genocide committed against African people that incidentally Africans are solely responsible for in his white supremacist sanctioned view or issuing of the penchant of white races to demean, deny or denigrate the civilizations that black people have produced on the African continent is sincere. In lieu of Gates's seeming, seemingly relentless assault on people in Africa, Preston wonders, does he rail at his white wife because her ancestors sold, bought, and enslaved his ancestors? This is highly improbable because the religion of white world terror domination would not be served by such behavior. Gates's evaluative criteria and, and ulterior selectivity in deciding when and when not to express his full righteous indignation seems to be based upon the question how will my actions contribute to the intellectual war being waged by the religion of white world terror domination against the diabolical revelation of Afrocentricity? In fact, if Gates truly had an issue with the rulers of the slave kingdoms, it is probably, in all actuality, an issue of self-hatred in the sense that he sees his reflection in his depiction of these rulers. As noted by Windley, at one point, he descended to a level of vulgarity, saying he was annoyed by black Africans kissing the behinds of whites, a curious objection considering his personal circumstances. The guy's married to a white woman. Indeed, his role vis-a-vis -vis the directives of perpetuating white world terror domination's war on Afrocentrists is scarcely differentiable from the role of his slave kingdom autocrats in perpetuating genocide against African people. In both cases, the constituencies in question sell their own people out in exchange for the benefits that white world terror domination has to offer. But what truly is the effect of wonders of the African world and Gates's aggressive submission to the directives of white world terror domination to demonize, quote unquote, bad Afrocentricity? Masrui voices his concerns thus. Some of us fear that in your efforts to repair relations between white America and black America, you may be sowing the seeds of discord between African Americans and the peoples of the African continent. By trying to shift the main burden of guilt for slavery from whites to blacks, you may conceivably help race relations in the United States. But does the price you are exacting amount to raising levels of animosity among the next generation of African Americans towards Africans. Hmm. Hmm. Not that it wasn't going on then, right? But look at what's happening now. How much has a, a guy like Gates contributed to that? That's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. In the chat, um, Daily Affirmation by Pauline is here saying good evening. You all say what's up to Daily Affirmation by Pauline. 
check out her channel, follow her, her on um, social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. She recently, back in, I think it was February, she released her first book. And, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book on, you know, a daily affirmations for 30 days. You guys make sure to check it out. Uh, she says, good evening. I always watch this Finding Our Roots and had not heard this about him before. Mr. Untouchable says, Pauline, he's a bad man. He ain't nobody. Uh, Mr. Untouchable goes on to say, it's funny how you hear his ideas in the mouths of these so-called reparations xenophobic groups. Absolutely. Right? Daily affirmation by Pauline says to Mr. Untouchable that she's shocked by what she's hearing. Gas them up says, great point. Skippy is the foundational black American progenitor. That's Tito District says to Mr. Untouchable 100. Tito District also says congratulations to Daily Affirmations by Pauline on the book. Gaston Up says Skippy is a PhD, Tariq Nashi. Yeah, and that's the thing that you pick up here too. One of the things you pick up in this reading, too, is Tariq. Well, we always knew Tariq is a grifter, but he's also a lifter as well. Tariq will take ideas from people and run with it. And you will think that it's Tariq's uh, uh, ideas. Like Tariq's early discourse in, in, in this space he took all that shit from Francis Cross Welsing. He took it from uh, Neely Fuller. Like, he lifts a lot of ideas from people. This FBA stuff that he takes, some of this is Skip Gates, some, uh, t you know, talking points. A lot of it is, uh, what's his brother's name? Well, I, I shouldn't even call him brother. Dr. Claude Anderson. A lot of this is Dr. Claude Anderson. You know, so you have to watch these guys, too. You have to watch, well, who is the originator of this stuff? Who is the progenitor of this stuff? And that's something that, uh, like, got some upset on Shoot the Breeze a little while back. We got we to gotta start excommunicating people because clearly some of the stuff that these folks say is being lifted and passed on and repackaged and passed down to the next set of listeners, the next set of learners, the next generation. We gotta, we really have to have to close ranks on that stuff. This is exactly the tides required by Gates's religious affiliation, white world terror domination. Not so much to repair race relations as to secure a spot among white world terror domination's most elite clergy. Such a price has been well assessed by one, quote, who understands the costs and the pleasures of achievement, end of quote. To achieve such a position, it is imperative that the next generation of African people in America accept the doctrine of a demonized Afrocentricity. Let me read that sentence again. To achieve such a position, <clears throat> right, for Skip Gates and people like him, to move up and find a little cozy little spot in white world terror domination, also known as white supremacy, et cetera, right? To achieve that position, it's imperative that the next generation of African people in America accept the doctrine of a demonized Afrocentricity. And that right there sums it up. That's the job of these kind of guys. Listen. Tariq Nasheed and them doing the same stuff too. They just ain't doing it where it's so obvious. But those guys, are, 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 I'm certain, right? And this is this is just my thoughts, my conjecture. Those guys are, are shills for the Republican Party and all that kind of stuff. While they're fleecing people who need their ego stroked, while they're fleecing those people, they're probably getting some kickback from the Republicans too. 
Let me just got to be real about this. The other side is the Yvette Carnells and them who are clearly, if they're not receiving some funding from the Democrats, they're working to get some nice job, some little cushy spot. And we got to be real about that stuff. And to achieve that position, you have to sabotage black movements, black thought, positive black thought, positive black women. You have to sabotage all of them. Hmm. This imperative largely echoes yesteryear's FBI counterintelligence program stance towards black nationalism. The purpose of this new counterintelligence endeavor is to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize the activities of black nationalist hate type organization. In every instance, careful attention must be given to the proposal to ensure the targeted group is disrupted, ridiculed, or discredited through publicity and not merely publicized. Y'all understand that? The final goal should be to prevent the long-range growth of militant black organizations, especially among youth. Specific tactics to prevent these groups from converting young people must be developed. Efforts of the various groups to consolidate their forces or to recruit new or youthful adherents must be frustrated. Understand? Gassed him up in the chat says Tariq was pro African, pan African, and then he realized the Africans ain't got the credit card disposable income for his products and he went back to scamming his own folks. Well stated. Azuliism is here, and he echoed what I said about the Republicans. Azuliism, I um, sent you a message earlier. I want to talk to you about something when you have a chance. Tito District says, meanwhile, Euro-Americans are solidifying ties of unity with their European counterparts on the continent with aid to Ukraine. These ADOS FBA folks are hustling backwards. And that's right there. That could be a tweet. If it was a tweet, that's the tweet. If that comment from Tito District was a tweet, that's the tweet. And you guys know what I mean by that, right? These guys are, are, are bringing in more Nazis into America, man. Before I go back to the reading, Mr. Untouchable says, Coco, the only issue I have is if the hippo ain't thirsty, he ain't going to drink the water, no matter if you submerge uh, your head in it. Our community are hungry hippos. I, I, I agree. But the sabotage ain't helping nothing either because if you take away the sabotage and because that's the thing about about these sellouts like skip the truth gates and the Tariq Nasheeds and whatnot if you had put white skin on them and have them say the same stuff our people would be aware our people would be uh, a, a bit more skeptical, I should say. Maybe not fully aware, but a bit more skeptical about what are you really trying to do, white guy? Well, because it's coming from a black guy. And he, all these black guys have one thing in common, too. They always glorify the streets and always glorify a connection to the streets. You know what I mean? But that's how they get the people. They, they prey on this need for our people because of what we've endured, and I'm talking about our people as a collective, right? Because of what we've endured and still endure, a lot of us need our egos to be picked up. And we don't know how to pick it up ourselves. So here comes the, here comes the religious leader, right? And again, if you watch a lot of these guys, they carry themselves like, like, like preachers, like pastors, like imams, right? That's all a part of the game is to give you that, 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 you know, that pick me up and make sure you drop your tides before you leave 
the quote unquote church today. This is the game that, that, that we have. Trigger happy says, but the hungry hippos will die and we won't have a community at that point. Rizulism says it's easy to fool insecure people who are looking for validations. This is what I'm talking about. And if you want to get in nice with white folks, go to them with a plan on how you're going to fool insecure black folks who are looking for validation. Azuliism is a filmmaker, right? If Azuliism wants to make it in Hollywood, go to them with a script, right, that glorifies some white guy, denigrates Africans, and he will be getting roles. He'll be doing work for the next, for the rest of his life. It is interesting to note that these hate-type organizations, as delineated by the grand pontiff of white world terror domination, Herbert J. Hoover, included Martin Luther King Jr.'s Integrationist and Accommodationist, SCLC. Apparently, Afrocentrism is similarly enough of a threat to the religion of white world terror domination to warrant comparable attempts to demonize, discredit, misdirect, and prevent its existence, at least in its real form and long range growth. In the place of diabolically inspired Afrocentrism will be the divinely inspired discontinuous revelation of those who would prefer to see a more mainstream agenda. Thus Thornton's call to arms for a mainstream agenda to be pumped into the schools is represented in his Africa and Africans in the making of the Atlantic world 1400 to 1800. In the book, he ingeniously, albeit deviously, and systematically uses the ideological premises of Afrocentricity, placing Africa at the center, in attacking the perpetually unnamed pseudo-historical and ahistorical doctrines and documents of diabolically inspired Afrocentrism. Similar to Gates, Thornton cleanses Afrocentricity of his diabolical element that requires that it be used for the best interests of African people and proceeds to put Africa and African people at the center of responsibility for the genocide against African people by whites and any Gates-like collaborators they may have been. Without the participation of Africans, there would have been no slave trade. How naive about power can we get? Without the involvement of Africans, there would be no colonialism either. Without the involvement of Africans, there would be there would have been no apartheid. Without the involvement of African Americans, there would have been no segregationist order in the Old South. That's from Ali Mazrui. Centrality of Africa and the African people in this context mitigates the white man's burden of responsibility. Thornton proves that, true to Asante's claim, Afrocentricity is dynamic, processual, and flexible the only rigidity being the centrality of Africa as symbol and spirit. Yeah, you know, when I think about this definition now, it, it really is weak. You know, it really is weak. Using the inclusive approach, Thornton adheres to this aspect of Afrocentricity vigorously because by applying it to the genocide of African people, this methodology serves the interests of the religion of white world terror domination. These interests are expressed in Thornton's exonerating Europeans of culpability in the genocide of African people as evinced in the following formulaic utterances that permeate the book. So here we go. Although the state might be a silent beneficiary, Trade remained competitive, probably favoring no particular national or regional actors, and certainly not Europeans at the expense of Africans, this guy. In summary, we can say that although European arms, this is a, a part of Thornton's um, statement from his book. In summary, we can say that although European arms may have assisted African rulers in war, in some cases, they were not decisive. Therefore, Europeans did not bring about some sort of military revolution that forced participation in the Atlantic slave trade as a price for survival. 
Another from his book, in conclusion, then we must accept that African participation in the slave trade was voluntary and under the control of African decision makers. This was not just at the surface level of daily exchange, but at deeper levels. Europeans possess no means, either economic or military, to compel African leaders to sell slaves. Let me tell you all something. Let me post this in the chat for you guys. You guys let me know exactly what your feelings are towards that statement that, that you see highlighted on the screen right now, right? When you build an education, a curriculum around that, right? You you guys, if you're not in, in, in America, in the U.S., you guys know that there's this backlash about critical race theory and all that shit being taught in school. And in some of these states, these guys are creating their own textbooks with their own facts. When you create textbooks with these type of facts in it, and again, remember what Obadale says earlier, that America wants its African population to, to adhere to America. When you put this in a, in a, in a school book, what will the Africans in America then think? Who will become their enemy? Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm, mm. Such is the means that Thornton adopts to philanthrop uh, philanthrop uh, uh, what what's the word philanthrop whatever give African people agency. This gift of agency is like an IMF World Bank loan. The debt burden that comes along with accepting it is simply not worth it. Africa and Africans in the making of the Atlantic world, 1400 to 1800, which one, which one would not hazard to call pseudo-history or ahistorical is essentially one long extended conjecture. Thornton's own philosophy in which the line between fiction and historiography is blurred is instructive in understanding his writing. Do these things really matter? One hopes, so, 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 so this is from uh, Thornton's writings, right? Do these things really matter? One hopes ideally that a piece of historical fiction like this one takes the minimum liberties with history and tries as much as possible to get those elements of the story that are verifiable by historical research as right as possible. Fiction should only be used when the sources simply fail and then probably only in such a way that one can say this or that event could have happened, even if we cannot say for sure that it did happen. Now, guys, what does Skip the Truth Gates talk about? He said that Afrocentrist activists tend to distort and make up history. What is this guy telling you right here? Man, man, let me um, let me check out the comments real quick. I don't like the comments to get too too far um behind me. Mister Untouchable says he's diabolical. Tito District says a complete falsehood. Gas him up says this level of assumption that European interaction did not change the war dynamic is hilarious. Skippy loves to use this as an example, yet he fails to account for what was imported in Africa. Gassama goes on to say the Aro Chukwu, the Aro Chukwu, um, um, Jaja of Opobi, Madam Tinunbu, Nana of its 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 curry. Etc. The list goes on of major slave traders. They use guns and cannon to gra to grab slaves. Akanfo is here. Akanfo uh, has been checking out past episodes of Shoot the Breeze. I appreciate you for that. He says, "Greetings to the hosts and all." This rhetoric, this this rhetoric, obfuscation and deception is the basis for divide and conquer. 
but it only works when a black face is shown. Tito District said these guys are straight up a historical. Jay says, little known, King Leopold brags about freeing Africans from um, slave from the slave trade in 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 and on monuments. Um, the Brussels Jubel Park near the 200 plus year old mosque. I'm just saying. Um, yeah, that King Leopold, we, um, back when I had the book club, me and Carl Hezekiah, we, uh, covered that book, King Leopold's Ghost. And uh, it, it goes to what, um, a confo said earlier, these guys deal in deception, man. They will write these letters and do all this bullshit to, to say, oh, look at the benevolent associations we have with the Africans in the Congo. Meanwhile, you're chopping off the hands of children in the Congo. And what's crazy is when you read that book, King Leopold's Ghost, and by the, by the way, the author has a funny past too. Uh, I forget now. I think his father is some asshole too. But um, when you read that, the thing that you get from the reading is like, a lot of these nations who King Leopold was, was stunting for to, and pretending that he was doing good in the Congo, a lot of them kind of knew it was bullshit, right? A lot of them kind of knew it was bullshit. He had to get America to kind of back him and stuff like that. That, that You know, it, it's, it, it's, 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 it's crazy. Um, Trigger Happy said, the biggest reason for why the Ma'afa happened is that Europeans simply had the monopoly on guns and weapons. If Africans across the board had a better means of manufacturing guns, things would be different. Gas them up says, Skippy would not know African history if it penetrated him. Speaking of such, he sure got his wake-up call when the white man arrested him in his own house for the crime of penetrating a white woman. Till this day in Belgium, they still eat chocolate hands. Oh, they, is that right? I didn't even know that. My God. Um, Trigger Happy says the Mafia was simply a proxy war, or as Dr. Uh, Chinwizu would say, a black chattelization war, a proxy war to gain and manufacture slaves. It was simply a different method for Europeans as opposed uh, to capturing slaves by force. Gas them up says, uh, yeah, it's about penetrating a white uh, a white woman in this house. Um, yeah, so let's continue with the reading. I know I'm taking up a lot of y'all time tonight. This is a long paper, but we're getting through it. The multitude of statements and conclusions punctuated by must have been the case, obviously, and it is clear then that every few lines become almost comical to the point that a student of stylistics would take note of this almost lyrical parallel parallelism that concludes most every sentence, paragraph, and or chapter, similar to Gates's altruistic motives of applying his philosophy of tough love to Africa, people in Africa. Thornton strives to uh, paternalistically give agency to apparently formally agency list African people. Yet at other times, he is much more um, miserly in his granting of agency. So here's a, a blur. Religious conversion, as it is conveniently understood, was therefore not simply a process of Europeans forcing Africans to accept an alien religion, nor did the practicing of traditional African forms of continuous revelation in the new world represent some sort of heroic religio-cultural resistance. You, you, you see the... For Thornton, African people can have agency, but only to the extent that such agency does not make for heroic religio-cultural resistance. Only when it makes for blaming Africans for European actions is agency granted. Also, Europeans cannot have done anything that might make someone think that they were in a way, shape, or form bad, forcing African people to do anything. 
Such is the, is the selectivity of the inclusive approach of white world terror domination as applied to Afrocentricity. This is the benevolent parity granted by the white terrorist friendly, anti-African Afrocentricity of Gates and Thornton. In another example, Thornton states that in the overall analysis of resistance, one can conclude that a great deal of American resistance simply arose from the exploitative nature of social and economic relations. It ought not to be seen as being any different from the reactions of any exploited group anywhere in the world. Moreover, such an analysis can be extended to the motives for revolt. And again, African people are denied the Baraka-like blessing of agency to be bestowed or withheld by Thornton when such agency could be used to further the cause of the diabolic Afrocentrist. Agency in fomenting rebellion and heroic religio-cultural resistance are just such topics that demonically possess bad Afrocentrists would just love to pick up and run with. Thornton, like Gates, is equally complicit in what Missouri calls cultural con, uh, condescension with, per, with paternalistic possessiveness and ulterior selectivity. This ulterior selectivity, in particular, is adeptly employed in service of the ideology and religion of white world terror domination. Far from an unreformed racist, Thornton's writing is often consistent with that of highly refined white terrorists. Oof. How was this consistency expressed? Thornton's own analysis is once again instructive in understanding the implicit and explicit intellectual war of the modern church of white world terror domination on diabolic Afrocentricity, here analogous to the church's reaction to continuous revelation. Nevertheless, the modern church was cognizant of the danger that continuous revelation held for their authority. And even though they recognized it, they also sought to contain it. They did this first by insisting on the primacy of the discontinuous revelation to the point of denying the validity of a revelation if it contradicted the Bible directly, while placing its interpretation in their own hands, and second, by ascribing revelations with which they did not agree to the devil. And again, again, and I, 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 I hate to bring it up because what I'm realizing more and more, and there's a particular person I have in mind when I say this, as much as a lot of folks talk about black power, black liberation movements, black nationhood, <clears throat> African, you know, Afrocentricity, in fact. A lot of us can't give up that religion shit. And a lot of us hide behind these ideas of, well, it was the religion that saved me or else I would have been a much worse person, dude. Okay, great. Great. Now you're a much better person. Move on to the next thing that matters more. If I have a cold and I take cold medication, I don't keep taking the fucking cold medication after the cold is gone. I'm better now. If it saved you, if it helped you, cool. Now you're saved. Now get to what needs to be gotten to. But this whole thing that these folks believe in, there's, there, there's mans in them who stood up and decided, uh, no, no, next. Yeah, okay, we'll accept that one. Um, nah, reject. Like this is what these do. I need to, these dudes built a whole a whole you know I haven't done a station ID break. I should probably do that soon. Um in the chat though. Um Jay says 
the Dutch pulled a king out their ass to continue slavery after it was abolished. Belgium was a new nation after a civil war. Um, Akanfo says, the relationship between the Eastern Asian and the Western Asian is what combined to enslave our ancestors, nothing more. He says, these made up stories of us selling each other is ended real quickly when you follow the finances. That's what I used to tell people back in the day. Follow the money. Follow the money. Right? Um, Trigger Happy 262 says, I honestly think certain scholarship contributes too. Scholarship trying to prove that there was African presence in the Americas, scholarship on the Moors, and scholarship on African influence on Christianity. I agree with that too. There's a lot of folks who are trying to fit round pegs into square holes or square pegs into round holes, right? We got to stop some of that too. Uh, and, and, and there's this thing, there's this obsession really with Africanizing European concepts. And that needs to stop too. Let me, uh, let me continue reading. Afrocentricity in the hands of Thornton becomes an exercise in putting Africa at the center with ulterior selectivity. So I want to remind everyone again, if you weren't here at the start of the show, I'm reading this paper because this paper is actually a critique on the concept of Afrocentricity. And as we talked about on Shoot the Breeze this past Saturday, Malefe Asante and uh, Afrocentricity International have parted ways. There was a statement put out. We discussed it on Shoot the Breeze. Go check it out, right? Um, but one of the things that we we brought up is that, you know, Malefe has now transitioned to this thinking about it's about humanity. It's not about, you know, Africanity or, or, or what have you. It's about humanity. And this paper so far, if you, if, you, if you keep that in mind, this paper is showing you how the concept of Afrocentricity was somewhat poorly constructed to begin with. And so, yeah, especially as this man, um, Molefi, is getting older, you know, becoming a pensioner, um, you know, he came off of his original stance. But the thing that we should understand is that his original stance was kind of weak. We accepted it because it centered Africa, but when you look at the other elements in his definition, it's not strongly rooted. So yeah, he himself fell off his own stance. And, and that's the importance of this paper uh, I, I know we're talking a lot about um, Skip the Truth, Gates, and this white boy Thornton, but that's really what we're thinking. That's what we should be thinking about as we read. Um, Afrocentricity in the hands of Thornton becomes an exercise in putting Africa at the center with ulterior se selectivity. Thus, its benign interpretation is incorporated into the religion of white world terror domination when elements designed by vulgar cultural nationalists, all of whose pseudo ahistorical continuous revelations are likely attributable to the devil, to work in the best interest of African people are eradicated. This analogy to religion is useful in the sense that, as defined by Asante, all religions rise out of the deification of someone's nationalism. I agree with what he's saying. All religions rise out of the deification of someone's nationalism. This concept is extended to Afrocentricity and Enjaya as opposed uh, as proposed by Asante. The religion of white world terror domination is no different as it is the general deification of white nationalism and at times anti-African, anti-black support of it in serving the interests of the system of white world terror domination. Thornton and Gates perpetuate this nationalism while ascribing revelations they did not agree with ostensibly to the devil, or at least 
to diabolically inspired Afrocentrists. More powerfully, however, they use Afrocentricity's core ideology of putting Africa at the center in the service of white world terror domination. Although Asante claims that wonders of the African world is a Eurocentric enterprise, it is instructive to note how his own warning, quote, when our tactics become the objective, we fall victims to self-deception, end of quote, manifests itself as a truism. Asante calls wonders of the African world a Eurocentric enterprise, when in all actuality, Gates and Thornton have accepted Afrocentricity's only rigidity, the centrality of Africa. This acceptance of Afrocentricity as a perspective and a philosophical outlook that is only superficially related to color is consistent with the inclusive approach of our extended metaphor within Christianity in its dealings with indigenous religions. When selectively applied and incorporated, Afrocentricity as a methodology, tactic, may readily be reinterpreted to vilify its originators and utilize to undercut its own conclusion. So you, so you guys feel me now, right? You guys, if you understand how, I, how I'm tying it back to the recent development with Molefe Asante, Type one in the chat for me. That'll also let me know that folks are still actually listening to the show. For Asante, not to recognize his own child, albeit exposed to effects of figurative bleaching cream and a straightening comb, indeed proves the fallacy of allowing a tactic or method to become the objective or means of self-identification and definition. Through wonders of the African world, I see there's some ones coming up, so I, I guess I'm making some sense. Through wonders of the African world and Africa and Africans in the making of the Atlantic world, 1400 to 1800, Gates and Thornton, as a dynamic duo of white world terror domination, effectively, to the extent that it is imperceptible to the public, use a castrated form of Afrocentricity to perpetuate and defend white world terror domination, a.k.a white supremacy, a system of power and privilege in its war to neutralize, demonize, discredit, and ridicule the potential threat of diabolical Afrocentricity. Let me ask you guys something. Let me pause here for a quick second. Uh, we're, we're getting towards the end of the paper now. Uh, let me pause here for a second. Thank you for, for a Confo, Trigger Happy, Tito District, for hitting that that one button for me and letting me know that you're still here and you're following the logic of um you know of this paper in relations to to the recent events. Um but let me ask you guys a question. After hearing all that we've heard so far, how would you define Afrocentricity? Right? How would you define Um, Afrocentricity, because this is showing us too that not only is it important to name yourself and name your surroundings, but it's also important to make sure that the definition of that name is solid. Because the naming will be solid if its definition ain't solid, right? How would you guys define Afrocentricity? I'll read your comments live on the air if you give me some, right? Since the time of wonders in the African world, Asante, for his part, has published uh, copiously on his conception of Afrocentricity. Afrocentricity, however, seems to continue to be tied to the enslavement of African Black people and absolving whites from blame for it. This has also been a continued thrust of Thornton. Another major development is a new version of discrediting diabolical Afrocentricity with the vilification of the term hotep, translating it tr translating to um, be at peace, peaceful, become calm, as a pejorative term for anyone who is not overtly anti-African, anti-Black diaspora. This, this is important. This is important to pick up too. 
this is a uh this is often seen on social media and social media carries weight in the world today you'll often see some picture and and and, and in fact there was a sister on twitter today i forgot her name now but she made the point she said anytime you hear the term hotep used expect there to be some black misandry to follow and damn sure anytime you hear hotep used is used in a negative it's associated with kinte cloth and African dress and black men and all that kind of stuff. And that's something that's very important in the miseducation that goes along, right? Numerous articles have been penned by the new vanguard of Henry Louis Gates replacements who operate in an uh, internecine realm of anti-Africanist, anti-blackness. For this new vanguard, rather than vilifying um, rather than vilifying wrong, wrongdoing, falsehood, chaos, any and all who are not anti-African, anti-Black are the collective target. Just as in the case of diabolical Afrocentricity, this collective target is then attacked under the label of Hotep, which is apparently the new version of diabolical Afrocentricity. We find that this seemingly new imperative of anti-Africanness, anti-Blackness is not unprecedented by any means as it forms part of a long-standing tradition of anti-black comprador collaboration and self-annihilation in service to white world terror domination. The upshot of this internecine conflict is the same as that of internecine conflict during enslavement. Namely, pale, white Eurasians go largely unscathed, while African um, blacks suffer the, the brunt of the damage. As there is a two-pronged attack on African Black people from pale or white Eurasians and their anti-African, anti-Black collaborators, African or Black champions and intellectual warriors must remain vigilant by not falling for the gambit of straw man, diabolical Afrocentricity, or the new version of Hotep bashing. Rather, what is necessary is the continued tradition of standing against wrong, wrongdoing, falsehood, and for the restoration of the feminine African black principle of ma'at, truth, right doing, righteousness, justice, rightness, orderly management. As in the prophecies of Nefertiti, when this is done, and so um, Obadale uh, deals in hieroglyphics, as you guys know from the interview I did with him. So he, he, he interprets these, these figures and uh, he added that to this paper. It says, then order will return to its seat while chaos is driven away. Right? That was a prophecy of Nefertiti. Then order will return to its seat while chaos is driven away. And that is the paper for tonight. Um, I, I got no answers to how would you define Afrocentricity. So if... Mr. Untouchable will remind me if I, in case I forget, um, that should be one of the, that should be one of the prompts for shoot the breeze. How would you define Afrocentricity? I just want to remind you guys that this show, the Bitter Medicine Podcast, is part of a podcast network, and there are other shows you are invited to tune into. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. Again, if you guys need or want this paper, uh, hit me up on the Discord, the Link is pinned to the top of the chat. It's also down in the description. If you also want to read that, um, 
what do you call it? That communication on the separation between Molefe Asante and um, Afrocentricity International. I also put it down in the description of this video. You can click the link. It's a MailChimp link. And it'll take you to the full story of what went on. Marcus McGee actually answered my question. I appreciate that, Marcus. He said Afrocentricity to him is knowing where he came from and how, I, and, and, and how he got here. So Afrocentricity to Marcus McGee is knowing where he came from and knowing how he got here. And I appreciate that. We're going to bring that question back for Shoot the Breeze um, on Saturday. Look like I may have lost some of the folks who were listening. I know the show was a little bit long tonight, but I hope it was, I hope it was edifying for those of you who tuned in. Let me thank Marcus McGee for tuning in, Trigger Happy 262 Plus, Akanfo, Tito District, Jay. Um, gassed them up. Um, Zuliism. Who else? Did I miss someone? Daily Affirmations by Pauline. Mr. Untouchable. Right? Uh, I think that's it. KW Dawn 7 was here earlier. He's going to listen in on the playback. Marcus McGee, of course. How can I forget Marcus McGee? Yeah. Um, like I said, Jay gassed them up. Yeah, I want to thank all of you, all of you for tuning in tonight. Tito District is going to get the last word here. She said it was a great show tonight, and I feel good about that. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'll see you guys hopefully on Thursday on the other platform, KW, KWAZ Radio. If not, I'll see you Saturday night here for Shoot the Breeze. You guys take care. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Beta Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, betamedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ Radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Beta Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Beta Medicine Show, Twitter, Beta Meds, Tumblr, Beta Meds, Instagram, Beta Medicine.